How's it going? Good. A lot of stuff up here. That's okay. I'm not complaining. Far be it for me to ever do anything like that. That wasn't a joke. So, a um, couple of things before we get into the word. First of all, it's good to see all of you this morning. Love you guys. You're awesome. Also, our monitors were like a little extra quiet here on the stage so I could hear all of you worshiping today. You guys sound good. A bunch of good singers in this place. So praise the Lord for that because I've been in services where that wasn't true. <laughs> hey, next Saturday, we're going to start on the process of painting the church. Which is, yeah, uh, which involves a lot of prep outside, a lot of pressure washing, a lot of scraping, a lot of, you know, patching stucco and stuff like that. So the good news is, is that we have a total expert, a master painting contractor to guide us and tell us how to do that in Victor. So we're thankful for Victor, right? Yeah, Victor! But Victor's just one man, and he needs some help, right? So this next Saturday at 8 o'clock, we're going to work on prepping the building to get it ready for painted. And, you know, it's, it's not like it's going to be, um, it's not super difficult. There's just so much building. This building is like, it's sneaky big when you get into it. I mean, it's like from the street, it's like you think it's just small, but then you actually realize this church is actually 12,000 square feet. And there's a lot of perimeter wall and inside wall because it's kind of built like a J-shaped building. So there's a lot, of, a lot of work that needs to be done. So we need some help. That's um, this next Saturday at 8 o'clock. And Tori, is there like a sign-up sheet for that? So yeah, there's a sign-up sheet back there on the hub to sign up to help with that. And we would greatly appreciate it. The church will look so beautiful when it's done, and, um, you know, it's going to look so good. Like, people for hundreds of miles around will hear about it and just flock to these doors, and we'll have to go to five services just to hold them all. So, so it's important. Okay. So, anyways, next Saturday, 8 o'clock. Huh? Yes, it will. Yes. So, um... On the third Sunday of every month, we do something called the Church Report. And this is something that we started coming out of COVID because our church looks so different coming out of COVID. For one, people just, they begin to kind of trickle back in, and it was even hard to tell for a long time who was still at the church, who wasn't at the church. And then not only that, we added a second campus in Anderson. So part of our church went to Anderson and part of the church stayed here. And so we'd come into church and it was like, wow, where'd everybody go? What happened to the church? And one, I mean, no doubt, I think people, probably some people did leave during COVID, but also new people have come as well. But the other major change too is prior to that, we didn't do any live streaming of our services. And now there's still a percentage of our church that just watches online and maybe comes to church, you know, less often. So the church just looked different. And it was raising questions in people's minds. So um, what we started doing was just bringing some information that used to be on the back of bulletins when we still did bulletins. But now we just do it once a month in person here to kind of let you know how the church is doing. Because it's hard to tell sometimes from just uh, what you might see on the Sunday that you come. So we like to let you know how the givings are going, you know, because all of us play a part in that, and all of us should be praying for our church to do well financially. So the tithes that came in in the month of April, this is the church report for April, uh, we had $26,051 come in in tithe in the month of April. That's a pretty good month. Like if we had one of those every month, you know. So get with it, church. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, great job, church. 26000 in tithe came in. Uh, for missions, we did $838 to Foursquare Missions International. So that is awesome. Also, in the month of April, you served 92 meals that celebrate recovery. So we're ministering to our community in that way. 
in-person attendance for the month of April was an average of 125 people per Sunday. I, it's like I said, the church is just kind of slowly growing back, you know? And it's another reason why I like this report, because as I said last month, growth is one of those things, whether it's spiritual growth or physical growth or even numerical growth or financial growth in a lot of cases, it's something that you don't feel while it's happening, but it's still happening, right? And the perfect analogy is like when you're raising your kids, you see them every single day and you don't realize they're getting any taller. They just seem like, oh, there's my kid again today. There's my kid again today, right? But then somebody who hasn't seen your kid for a few months sees your kid and they're like, man, they're stretching up. They're growing like a weed. Look how much taller they are. And it's like, really? Yeah, I guess they are. And that's how growth happens even in church. You don't realize it because you're here all the time and you're not seeing it take place. But it's taking place little by little. Little by little. I still say it. We're coming back, church. We're coming back. So I'm stoked with it. Um, And then our online service views were 54. Also, in the month of April... Uh, we as a church opened up our Anderson campus doors to house another church called Journey Church, and that has been such an incredible blessing to them. And also, I will tell you that it is a blessing to that community. So they have a food ministry that they um, facilitate as a church. They don't actually do it, but they, they host a ministry that does it. But they brought that with them down to Anderson. You'll see there's a forklift down at the church now, and they take out pallets of food. And they're feeding about eight or 900 people a week in Anderson. So it's all just kingdom work, right? It's all doing things for the Lord. And, you know, we have this building down there that we were basically using once a week for about two hours on Sunday. And it just seemed like this is not a good enough use of a kingdom resource. So we opened up our doors to host that church and house them in there and give them a home that they could feel free in and be able to use and do studies in or wherever they need to do things as a church. And not only are they blessed by it, but the community is being reached for it. So it's just work for God's kingdom, however it takes place, right? That's what we want to do. And then throughout the week with youth group and celebrate recovery and all that we were ministering to about 51 people a week so god is doing some awesome things and we are thankful for it and looking forward to what god will continue to do are you ready to get into the word we are going to get back into acts acts chapter 5 today and we are going to do the story of ananias and sapphira I've been putting this off for weeks, right? It's like, and you know, this is, it's not like without reason. It is a difficult portion of scripture. I had a retired minister come up to me after the first service, and he's like, I just avoided that one when I was preaching. <laughs> he's like, I never did that chapter. And I get it. You know, when I was a kid growing up in church, though, growing up in the Assemblies of God, we heard it all the time, the story of because you heard everything from the book of Acts all the time growing up in the Assemblies of God. But, um, but we heard about Ananias and Sapphira all the time. And without fail, it was used to just scare the you-know-what out of you all the time. The same way they talked about communion, right? Like if you take communion and there's any sin in your life, if you got a problem, right? That for this cause, some of you are sick and even dead, right? Like God's going to do something to you. And they just scare you right out of taking communion. And that's not the message of 1 Corinthians 11 at all. But in the same way, here's Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, the story of the early church. And they would use this story to just scare you to death. I don't think that is the point of this message. So we're going to get into it today, starting in verse 1. We'll just read the story first, and then we'll kind of go back and break it apart a little bit. But it says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it. 
And he brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And then Ananias, hearing these words, he fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all the, those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it's about three hours later and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. And then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her out and buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon the church and all those who heard these things. So as I said, I've been wrestling with this portion of scripture as much as any other text in the Bible. And for me, again, this is the value, one of the values in expository preaching, where you go straight through a book of the Bible, chapter by chapter, is it doesn't necessarily allow you to skip the difficult portions of scripture. So the longer I've served Jesus, the further I've got along in my Christian walk, the more of a grace preacher I have become. Like, it would have been terrifying to hear what I would have done with this chapter 15 years ago, right? I, <laughs> you would have, you know, everybody would be afraid for their life right now, you know? But it's like the longer I've been serving the Lord and the closer I've gotten to God and the more I feel like Jesus is the love of my life, the more I have become a preacher of grace, God's grace. So this story of Ananias and Sapphira, not just in the Bible, but in the New Testament, and not just in the New Testament, but in the first early parts of the book of Acts that records the origins of the early church, the birth of the church. And here's the story right smack dab in it. It almost feels incongruent with the rest of the message of the New Testament. But we know that it's not. And we know that it fits because God's word is inerrant. It is perfect. It has exactly what we need. God knows exactly what he's doing. He knew what he was doing when this took place. So we know that it's, it's not contradicting what we know to be the heart of God in the rest of the New Testament, right? So, right? right. Okay, good. So, um, so here is another case where we allow the Bible to shape our opinions and thoughts. We don't develop some experiential understanding of God, right? Even though our experiences play into it, but it's not simply just our own experiences or our own thoughts or our own reasoning, you know, the way that we just, well, if it were me, I wouldn't do it, right? But we don't develop that and then try to make scripture fit that, we explore the scripture and then we allow it to shape our thinking, right? We allow it to be a central part of being transformed by the renewing of our minds. We are shaped by God's word. We don't shape God's word to fit us, okay? So that's how we will approach this today. And we're going to do that by exploring three perspectives on the story of Ananias and Sapphira. We'll need to do this rather quickly, so just kind of engage here because I got some things to share before our time's up. So the most common perspective, the first of the three that we'll look at, is that God did this to instill a holy fear into the church. And <clears throat> we know from verse 11 that it did do that, right? It tells us in verse 11 um, it says that great fear came upon all the church 
and upon all who heard these things. And certainly the fear of the Lord is not just a concept like exclusive to the Old Testament. We know this is a New Testament thing as well. Hebrews chapter 13 finishes by telling us it is a fearful thing to what? Fall into the hands of a living God. And also, it's still true that a reverent fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. So fear itself of the Lord, especially fear in the context of revering the Lord and having a a holy reverence for God, this isn't just an Old Testament thought. So fear coming upon the church, I'm sure that this wasn't an unintended consequence of the Lord at this occasion. So it's a good reminder to us, too, that the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament as well. And what is also Hebrews 13, 8 tell us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this is the same Jesus that we're serving. So God certainly is no one to be trifled with. However, we can't approach these scriptures too simply in it. Like the most base kind of cause and effect understanding of the scripture could lead you to some dangerous conclusions. Things like, if I lie to the Lord, he will kill me. That would be kind of a dangerous conclusion for us as Christians to draw from the scripture. Or even that there are certain sins that God will judge by taking my life or taking someone's life. Like that's how God reacts to certain sins. I mean, isn't that what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? But hopefully, we know that this is not true for us as children of God. We know that we serve a good, good father. And God is not looking for an opportunity to smite his children down. Even though I know that the Lord chastens, God corrects us. Whom the Lord loves, he chasteneth as a son, right? So that's, that's good. I mean, the correction of the Lord is proof that God loves us. But God doesn't chasten by killing, okay? That's not what a good, good father does. So all of these things have to kind of mesh together to help us understand this passage out of Acts chapter 5. We do have an assurance from God as children of God that the Lord will not pour out his wrath upon his children. That is a promise in God's word. And also, I was thinking about it, like what Ananias and Sapphira did here. They sold a portion of, or they sold a piece of property probably, or they sold some possession, and they kept some of the money for themselves, and they gave the rest to the church, and they lied about it. I was thinking in my 25 plus years now as a Christian, I feel like there's a chance that I may have done something worse than that. Like, I didn't take like a total inventory of my Christian life. Like, what have I ever done wrong? You know, and I don't, I haven't done something like that necessarily, but who's to say what's worse or what's better? So it's possible I may have done something worse than that. I know for a fact that all of you have done worse things than that. (laughs) That's funny, huh? I wrote it in my notes. I knew it would be funny. I couldn't forget to do it. It was was worth it to me. Okay. So we've all done things, though. (laughs) Tori. (laughs) She's just looking at me. (laughs) The eye roll from her is worth it to me. It's like, ah, uh, anytime I can make her do that, I'm good. So, but we all have done things that are wrong, and yet here we are still. So we're all still here. So, the first thing that I draw from this story is one that I think is the part that gets overlooked the most and maybe causes the, the, most, um, 
the most taking this the wrong way, this passage, is I don't believe that Ananias and Sapphira were saved. I don't think they were Christians in this story. There's nothing in the Bible that declares to me that God treats his children this way. And there's nothing in the story that declares that Ananias and Sapphira had received Christ as their savior. It's nothing that says that to us. And remember that this event happened in the presence of the apostles. They saw it take place. They fell at Peter's feet. And if this were some sort of example of God and his willingness to issue capital punishment to the body of Christ, don't you think that later on the apostles would have written about this in their letters to the church? Nowhere do you find in the writings of Peter or John or later on Paul or any of these writings, nowhere do you find them warned like, hey, if you ever lie about your tithe or something, <laughs> you know, you might want, want to do that because here's how God responds to that. You never find that warning anywhere else in scripture. If this were a literal precedent for how God deals with his children, the apostles would have written to us about it, but they didn't. They didn't. In fact, John specifically writes to us that perfect love cast out fear. And it, people always misquote that scripture and they say perfect love cast out all fear. That's not what the Bible says. It says perfect love cast out fear. I'm glad it doesn't cast out all fear. I'm afraid if I drive around a corner too fast that I'm going to wreck. So I slow down, right? I'm afraid if I do something wrong that this... Right, So some fear is good to have. It says perfect love cast out fear. It's talking specifically about a fear. And when you take that scripture in context, the fear it's talking about is the judgment of God. Meaning if you are in Christ Jesus and you were saved, you no longer have to be afraid of the judgment of God. That's not to say God isn't one to be re revered and respected and honored, and you certainly don't want to do things to upset the Lord intentionally for sure, right? But if you are in Christ Jesus, you do not have to be afraid of God judging you, killing you, and sending you to hell. That's not part of being a Christian. And if it were part of it, they would have written to us about it. So this is not a precedent set for the body of Christ. I think it's even a different kind of precedent, actually. So the second perspective that I want to talk to you about is um, if you approach chapter 5 from the perspective that Ananias and Sapphira were not Christians, then it changes everything. Because was God then, was he judging the church or was he protecting the church? It's totally different. If they were Christians and a part of the body of Christ, then that declares to you about something God is willing to do to his church. If they were not Christians and were attempting to exploit the body of Christ, then it tells you that something that God will do on behalf of his church. And it changes completely what you think about God relative to Acts chapter 5. I don't think God was striking down his children. It is the difference between God judging the church or God protecting the church. Acts chapter 5, it begins with this critical little word. It says, but, right? But a certain man named Ananias. What does that mean? It means that this this passage wasn't intended to just stand alone, but it's actually being given as a contrast to what came just before it. If we really want to fully understand what took place with Ananias and Sapphira, we have to find out what that is referring to. But Ananias, but in contrast to what? So if we back up just a little bit to Acts chapter 4, verse 32... It gives us insight into what was taking place in the church during that time and also introduces us to this guy named Barnabas, okay? Barnabas, who we know goes on to be a central figure 
in the communication of the gospel to the world. So in Acts 4, 32, just prior to the story of Ananias and Sapphira, it says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds to <clears throat> and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who's also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of, Cy of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here's what was taking place in the church. And this was exemplified by this guy named Barnabas, who had you know, developed such a good report in the church that he actually, the apostles gave him this special name, meaning son of encouragement. And he had sold what he had and he laid it at the apostles' feet and he was numbered among those who believed. So here's this, this sterling example of this person named Barnabas. And then it says, but Ananias and Sapphira, and I think it brings into question what the motivations of Ananias and Sapphira were. They see people reaping the benefits of being a part of the church. They see people being cared for and provided for. If they had lack, the church was taking care of them. And all this is happening. And not only that, but the people who are selling and, and um, laying these things at the apostles' feet are getting these accolades. And, and here's Barnabas, the son of encouragement. And they see this. And they go, hey, we could use a little piece of that. I wouldn't mind, you know, getting the benefits of whenever we needed something or had some lag. People would just bring us things and, and then people would give us a cool nickname like the son of encouragement. So they come and they, they lie and they scheme. It says that they actually, they came up with this scheme. They, they um, conspired together, the Bible says to sell but keep a portion of it for themselves, and they were trying to exploit what was taking place in the body of Christ. This was something that was happening fairly commonly in the early church. If you skipped ahead to Acts chapter 8, there's another story of this guy named Simon the Sorcerer, right? And Simon the Sorcerer was in this city where Philip was preaching and people are getting saved. And I think that maybe even Simon the sorcerer himself had an experience with Jesus on that occasion. But after Philip preaches and people receive Jesus, Peter comes on the scene then and starts laying his hands on them so that people are receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is that my kids? Oh, Okay, good, because I was about to come down on you like Ananias and Sapphira. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. So, anyways, um, what was I saying now? That's right, and that's what Peter was doing. So Simon sees this taking place, and obviously whatever Peter is doing here is having some major effects because people can see the evidence of people receiving this baptism. Now, Simon had been a person who had um, sway in that community prior to this. But now these guys are on the scene, and they got real power, real authority. Simon wants a piece of that. In Acts chapter 8, verse 18, it says, And when Simon, now keep in mind, this isn't Simon Peter. This is Simon the sorcerer. It says, and when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered money, saying, give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, your money perishes with you. 
Simon is dangerously close to having his own Ananias and Sapphira experience right here, right? He says, your money perishes with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. And then Simon, the sorcerer, he answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. And I believe the reason Simon probably didn't suffer that immediate fate like Ananias and Sapphira was there was something genuine about the work of Jesus in his life at this point. But there is a commonality between Ananias and Sapphira and what Simon was doing as well, in that they were all attempting to exploit the body of Christ for financial gain and for status. So after considering this, when we read this story, was God, again, was God judging the church or was God defending the church? Was God protecting the church? I think God was like vehemently defending the church in these stories. And even more specifically, I think God was defending the church in the same way that any parent would defend their newborn child. Like, I was wondering about that. We know that there are people today still trying to exploit the church for financial gain and for status, right? That is happening constantly. That is happening, I'm sure, right now this morning in this city that's taking place somewhere. That happens inside the body of Christ. And yet, those people aren't being, like, struck down every time it takes place. So I was thinking, God, why would you do it then? Why isn't it happening right now? And I do think that it points to something about the significance of the maturity and development that should have happened in the church. The church now has had access to the word of God for what, like 1,700 years? I think 300, around 300 something AD. I should know this off the top of my head, but that's when the canon of scripture was assembled, right? When the final collection was all put together and we ended up with the Bible as we know it. So let's say 1,700 years just to have a nice round number. For 1,700 years, we have been exploring and searching out the Word of God, having the Holy Spirit use brilliant theologians to teach us and guide us on it. The maturity and knowledge and understanding in the church is far greater now than it was 1,500 years ago or 1,700 years ago. The church is growing in understanding. That's why we've had things that take place like these great awakenings in the church or even the Protestant movement where they begin to protest against the legalized, formalized religions and start to see that God was a God of grace and we couldn't earn our way to heaven. All these things are greater enlightenings that have happened in the church. That being said, you defend a newborn differently than you defend a mature adult. I think had God not intervened in these very early stages of the church, what is, what is being recorded for us in the book of Acts? The birth of the church. And if people like Ananias and Sapphira and Simon the sorcerer had been allowed to infiltrate the body of Christ and begin to corrupt it in those early stages, who knows what, could have damaged, what kind of damage it could have done during that time. But now the church is not that. It should not be a baby church anymore. I, when my children were babies, right? I've got four kids. When they were babies, if something had been threatening my children while they were babies, my response would not have been rational, right? It would have been aggressive and violent and dangerous, right? Had somebody been a threat to my children when they were little babies? 
for sure. But then it starts to change as they get older. They get 10 or 12 years old and they're having a problem with a kid at school. Well, you don't just walk down there to the school and start slapping all the kids around, right? You start to, you start to speak to them and say, hey, maybe here's how you could talk to that person. Or maybe if you went to a teacher and explained what's happening. Or maybe, you know, if you just stood there and punched them in the face. No, I'm just kidding, right? But you start to encourage them to, not like you wouldn't intervene if it can't get handled, but you want them to start to know how to handle things. And now my kids are in their 20s, most of them. I have three kids in their 20s. When they have a problem at work, I don't go down there and get in their boss's face, right? These are things they have to know how to do now. They should know how to stand on their own. It's not to say I wouldn't defend them in a case where they needed help defending themselves, but at a certain point, they have to know how to stand, right? So you do see a difference in how God was... (laughs) protecting that early church in its infancy and the way that now we should be able to recognize when there's wolves among us trying to exploit us. It's not that hard to do. They see godliness as a form of gain. And they find people who have itching ears, meaning they want this person to tell them what they want to hear. And, you know, that person gets financial gain for doing it. It's not that hard to recognize. Okay, so God was defending the early church. And as a result, we see kind of a frightening side of God on display in Acts chapter 5. It's the same God we serve now, and he loves us just as much. But he's also equipping us to be able to stand against those things. Now, the third thing, Tori, what time is it? Oh, perfect. The last point that I want to explore, and it's just this third perspective on the story that I think is maybe not the main perspective, but one that we should, um, one that we should kind of extrapolate from Acts chapter five before we move on from it, is that we find basically two examples of God executing this type of fatal judgment in the New Testament. The first here is Ananias and Sapphira. And the second one comes a little bit later in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 12. And it happens with King Herod at that time. So King Herod was persecuting the early church and even putting some of them to death. And again, this is an alert to the motivation of God defending the church, but there's even more to the story than that. Um, In Acts chapter 12, verse 20, it says about Herod that he had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. But they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus the king's personal aid, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in his royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. That's what all the people are shouting to Herod on this occasion. And it says, then immediately the angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Now, here it is said specifically that this happened to Herod because he did not rebuff the people when they worshipped him as God. He allowed this glory that belonged to God to be lavished on himself. And I was wondering, okay, since there's not a lot of examples of God doing this in the New Testament where he literally moves on somebody and they die, right? The angel of the Lord, but still, it's God's doing that this person was killed. You have it with Herod and you have it with Ananias and Sapphira. Is there anything that is a common thread between those two stories? And I think there is. Because what was Herod guilty of? He was guilty of keeping the worship of God 
to, for himself. And in the same way, Ananias and Sapphira had taken something that was supposed to be an act of worship to the Lord, and they had kept it for themselves. And it does illustrate to us a powerful truth about God, and that is this. God will not share his worship in his glory with anybody. It belongs to him and no one else. I'm sure I'm not the only one who could say this, but I've seen so many powerful ministers start to decline and even slip into moral failure because they started to think that there was something more special about them than there really was. <clears throat> I grew up, I've said this many times, but I grew up in the Assemblies of God. And in the Assemblies of God, you know how like in the Foursquare Church, we have, he's almost like a patriarchal leader in Jack Hayford. And just what a great teacher and man of integrity he is. And he's just an example of humility and a powerful minister. And he's really done a lot to share wisdom through the Foursquare Church. Well, growing up in the Assemblies of God, there was a man like that for the AG as well, and his name was Jimmy Swaggart. And for any of you who know who Jimmy Swaggart is now, you would think of him as just kind of, you know, not somebody really to be taken that seriously. But you can't imagine the impact this, this guy had on the church back in the 80s and the 70s when I was a kid. I mean, it was his... When he had his moral failure, there were so many works in the mission field that literally closed down because they lost support from his ministry. And during that season, my stepdad, Harold Jackson, was a missionary in Ghana, Africa. He was in Ghana full time for eight years. And every missionary on the field received support from Jimmy Swigert's ministries during those times. And one time Jimmy came over there and he spoke to all of the missionaries out there on the field. And he said to them, they were all gathered there, and he said to them, God is going to use me to save the world. And Harold said out loud at the time, he said, that man's in trouble, right? Because God's only used one person to save the world, and that's Jesus, right? Right? Salvation only comes through Jesus. But there comes a point where people run that danger if they start to, you know, we're all, we're all conduits of God's goodness and benevolence to this world. God wants to use every single one of us to display his kindness and his love for people. And when God is doing that through us, people who don't know Jesus, they tend to want to turn the praise back to you. They'll say, oh, you're so amazing. That's so good. Why would you even care about us? Why would you do this for us? Why would you give us this? Why would you do these things for us? Because they don't recognize that it's God through us. But if we are a conduit for God's goodness to the world, we also need to be a conduit the other way of taking those praises and those, those acts, those like giving glory and piping them right back up to God, right? Right? And being quick to tell people, no, this is Jesus, and this is his love for you. And if not for him, I wouldn't be able to do anything for you. It's all the Lord. So it's got to be that kind of two-way street, you know, that we're just helping get people connected with the Lord. But the danger is, is you know, it feels good to maybe just keep a little bit of that for yourself. A little bit of that, and you start to hang on to it. And God will not share his glory with anyone. And this is not because God is a narcissist. This isn't because God is arrogant. This is because God is the only one who is worthy of it, and God is the only one who can handle it. Look at what happened to Satan when he tried to steal some of God's glory for himself. It corrupted him. He became the devil, right? Right? And he's way more powerful than we are. If he couldn't handle it, if he couldn't hold it, how would we think that we are? We cannot. All the glory belongs to God, not just because he's worthy of it, but yeah, because he's worthy of it. But we can't handle it. 
We can't handle it. Boy, you see such a, a danger here with Herod and with Ananias and Sapphira, these things that were supposed to be acts of worship to the Lord, and they said, I'm going to keep some of this for myself. I'm going to keep some of this offering for myself. I'm going to keep some of this praise that's come. I'm going to keep that for myself. It didn't work. It didn't work. So there is an example there or a truth to be pulled out that God does not share his glory with anyone. So I'll wrap up with this. We've explored three perspectives on this story of Ananias and Sapphira today. And one is that the church should have a holy fear and reverence for the Lord. There's no doubt about that. And, um, and God is certainly living and powerful. He's still the God who spoke the universe into motions. He's still holy. He still has no sin, and he's not someone to be trifled with for sure. But also, our Father in heaven is a fierce defender of his children. <clears throat> and people who attempt to defame and persecute and exploit his kids are walking a very dangerous path. And at the same time, too, we want to be careful as the church not to touch the glory of God. All glory belongs to Jesus. I think all three of these things really help us in our understanding of Acts chapter 5. And boy, when you look at it like that, it fits. It is congruent with the whole message of God's grace in the New Testament. God is good. He loves his church. He has saved us. He loves us. He's blessing us. He's caring for us. And all glory goes to him. Amen? Amen. Amen. There's no one like our God. No one. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, we thank you that it's just another example of how much you love us, you care for us, you are protecting us, you're teaching us to be able to stand to you, Lord. You want us to be able to stand up to, um, to people who would manipulate and exploit, but God, you are still our defender. I think about that imagery that the Apostle Paul gave us with the, um, with the armor of God. And how every part of the body was defended, except for it doesn't say anything about the back. And God, I believe that's because you have our back. God, you are the, the rear guard, Lord. You are the one who isn't allowing us to be jumped from behind, God. You have our back. So we are thankful for that, Jesus. And God, we want to be a people who give you all the glory, all the praise. God, what you've done in our life is more than we could ever ask for, Lord, the way that you have saved us, set us free, the way that you even equip us to love those who need help, God, and, and care for the lost and to bless people, even financially, Lord, when you're blessing your church and your church is able to bless those. God, every good and gift, every good and perfect gift is coming from you, and we just praise you for that, God. It's all your provision. It's nothing that we could do without you. And God, I believe it's nothing that we would even want to do without you. Without you, Lord, we are, we are selfish. And, um, and it's, not, it's not necessarily in us, Lord, to, to be super caring and generous, especially to those who don't deserve it. But Jesus, you gave us an example of it when you said, when you said through your word that while we were yet sinners, you died for us, Lord. So God, we thank you that not only are we recipients of grace, but we also are giving grace to people, Lord. And in return, Lord, we give you all the glory, all the praise. It all belongs to you. Thank you again for your word, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that if anyone in this room or even watching online, Lord, I just, I have a sense, Lord, that there might have been, um, you know, maybe a little bit of that, um, that little weed of pride that was taking hold of in somebody, Lord, or maybe an arrogance, or maybe that that kind of the beginning of that pitfall where we start to think there's something more significant about us than other people. I pray, God, that if that had started in anyone's heart, that that would be gone in Jesus' name. Lord, we are nothing without you. 
nothing, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your love, your grace. In your name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you, church. Love you guys.